Hello, and welcome to Connected with Latham, where we discuss ideas, legal developments, and business trends shaping the global economy. In this episode, we are talking about licensing, one of the key issues at the convergence of the healthcare and technology sectors. I'm Robbie McLaren, a partner in Latham's London office and global vice chair of our healthcare and life sciences industry group. And joining me are my colleagues, Judith Hasco and Jackie Kim from Latham's Bay Area offices. Judith is a partner and global vice chair of the firm's healthcare and life sciences practice, and Jackie is an associate in the healthcare and life sciences practice. Both have extensive experience advising life sciences companies and investors on a wide range of technology-based commercial matters, which gives them terrific insight into these issues. Welcome. Thanks, Robbie. It's great to be here today. Thanks for having us. Perhaps before we start, you could give us some uh, initial high-level thoughts on how the convergence of of technology and life sciences companies is affecting licensing practice in the, in the sector more generally. Perhaps I could start with Judith. Robbie, before we get started, I do want to note that licensing arrangements in the digital health and artificial intelligence space are relevant not only to companies operating in this area, but are also critical for investors, underwriters, private equity sponsors, boards of directors, and other advisors to these companies because licensing structures are key drivers of value in this area. Now let me address the impact that the convergence of technology and life sciences has had on licensing practices. When I'm advising companies on transactions that cross the technology divide, I find it helpful to keep in mind some of the historical schemes used for licensing in these two different sectors. On the licensing side for life sciences companies, historically, they've had a strong history of collaborating to develop new products and to identify new products. So there are licensing schemes that have been very creative and innovative to address the creation of new drugs, new technologies such as genetic engineering and gene therapy, medical devices. Those licensing schemes have always had to contemplate the application of currently existing IP and inventions, as well as future arising innovations and inventions and intellectual property rights. However, it's a highly regulated industry. You have to follow uh, approved protocols in certain ways to get the product approved. You have to perform clinical trials over many years. And as a result, there's a huge amount of investment that goes into product development. These companies protect their products using patent rights, trade secrets, trademarks, as well as regulatory exclusivity rights that they invest in and enhance over many years. So historically, there's been broad licenses granted by each party to discover technologies and products that do not yet exist. This also applies to the economics of these deals. And these deals uh, are structured in a way that recognizes the high risk by having more contingent payments integrated into the deal structure, as well as a high economic reward because there's been a high investment in product development. Jackie, how have uh, licensing schemes evolved in the complementary technology side? First of all, you know, health tech, med tech, digital health, in a sense, it's, it's a part of the traditional healthcare licensing scheme. Um, but before we dive in, perhaps it might be worth, uh, you know, setting the playing field of what med tech health tech or digital health might be, because these words kind of float around a lot, but uh, it hasn't really been defined, if you will, even by the regulators. And I think, long story short, they really don't have a a set defined term, meaning um, people use them interchangeably. Regulators still haven't figured out a way to define them. It's really, in a way, a convergence or a collision of traditional healthcare um, meeting or converging or colliding with pure technology, such as software and uh, your smartphones, your tablets, and your computers. Um, so with with that in mind, um, the 
licensing scheme, if the traditional sense really focused on patents and um, you know know how and other registration heavy IP. In the current digital health, health tech, and med tech world, we're focusing more on software and data. And software and data both are non-registrable IP, and software is copyright in a sense, but it's not something that one would want to register uh, and expose your software codes. Data is also not something that you want to, sh you know, publicly open and uh, share with others. So the licensing agreements that involve uh, AI and ML, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and software and, and data, if, um, these are treated a bit differently than the traditional healthcare life sciences agreements um, because of the um, heavy reliance on software and, and data. Thanks, Judith and Jackie. That, that's really interesting to hear. And I suppose as we see these sort of convergence of different styles of companies, or some might say the collision of these of these interactions between these various companies, I'm assuming we're seeing, you know, your traditional big pharma looking outside of their usual business circles for collaboration partners. Is that right? That's exactly right, Robbie. The, you have the historical players, uh, the biotech companies, the pharma companies, medical device companies, you have the innovation resources such as universities, medical centers, and other research institutes. And you have a lot of venture capital investors and angel investors involved in some way in structuring these transactions. Now uh, you have an overlay of additional companies uh, that Jackie can describe in more detail. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, there are now traditional tech companies such as Google, Facebook, Apple, you just name it, um, your other tech companies that you're familiar with, um, as well as pure data companies that have just aggregated data over the years and are selling, collecting, storing and buying more data in order to further sell and license data. So as the as the partners in these collaborations are are changing, you don't need to be a genius to figure out that obviously the products under development are also changing. Can you give us a bit of narrative as to as to how that's trending? Absolutely. There is a lot of change in the pharma and biotech sector every day, but when you're combining it with technology products, it's very quickly evolving. You have traditional pharmaceutical and biologic products that are discovered uh, historically by applying various biological and chemical technologies, or what I'll call more traditional computational modeling. The end goal of those products is a product in a vial or in some other packaging that gets to the patient that needs to be administered the product. You have medical devices. Historically, those have involved uh, various technologies, robotic surgery equipment, EKG equipment, various types of diagnostics as well, those would take a patient sample, analyze it, and report back for one moment in time what the patient's parameters were. Those are traditional products that have been enhanced by various technology products uh, in various ways, whether you're applying those technologies to speed development or to create something that could not have existed before. But you are seeing a whole wave of brand new technologies. So, you know, Judith just mentioned how traditionally, I mean, even current traditional science is evolving, um, but traditionally, product in a vial perhaps was considered as, or, or tablets were considered uh, therapeutics. Um, in the digital world or the technology world, uh, these products are any, anything in, from wellness apps, right? Apps that you can download on your phone to uh, surgical robots that perhaps one day uh, in a scary way, perhaps can you know perform surgery on you without an actual surgeon or uh, things that applications that actually can have therapeutic effects. So they're calling them 
digital therapeutics. With respect to digital therapeutics, these are actually uh, FDA approved or EMA or other regulatory authority approved therapeutics that have um, labels and are directed toward indications toward, uh, you know, treating certain psychological illnesses or behavioral therapies and diabetes and high blood pressure can have therapeutic effects or can be treated through certain behavioral changes. With respect to diagnostics, um, there are certain diagnostics that can use software. Um, Nowadays, uh, reading radiology images, those can be diagnostics. Whether or not you need a radiologist, that's uh, up for debate with the regulators. But if an AI machine learning algorithm can read radiology images better than an actual radiologist, is that a diagnostic or not? Again, that's something that we will need to see. Then there are other digital algorithms, if you will, that assist with finding new molecules that can then go back to the traditional uh, platform where traditional pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies can further develop in order to uh, develop and commercialize their traditional drugs for product in a vial. So it's really a circle of life that we're seeing. As we're kind of on the theme of change with respect to these sort of converging technologies and sectors, are we seeing a change in how the parties actually think about the jurisdictions in which they're licensing in technology? It used to be I don't want to say the olden days because these these activities still happen, but you were always clearly focused on access to partner, access to boots on the ground, access to the clinic, and access to a I don't want to say favorable regulatory regime, but a, a regulatory approval process that you were, was understood and collaborative. I mean, how is that changing? Yeah, Robbie, that's exactly right. The uh, traditional mode of focusing your transaction on, at the end of the day, how you get a vial of a product to a patient on the ground, it still applies. It's always going to be there because patients are going to need to take a given product, whether or not it is discovered using AI technology, for example. So if that's the type of product that you're eventually going to develop, not a lot has changed. Geographic-based licensing schemes reflecting the partner's uh, marketing capabilities, for example, are going to drive what rights are licensed to the partner. However, uh, with these different types of products that Jackie was mentioning, you do not need to have the same distribution network, marketing networks, as you did for uh, such a patient-specific delivery and distribution system. The geographic aspects, I think, is pretty similar to the traditional aspects, except um, with respect to technology, I think these tech companies are able to find pools of talent from anywhere in the world um, as compared to the traditional life sciences um, companies where the bench talent, if you will, were kind of limited and uh, the market size might be a bit larger because everyone has smartphones nowadays. So the market itself might be a bit larger. When we ask clients, where are you getting the data? The data is coming from EU, GDPR issues, as well as all over the world. Where are you developing your software? Oh, we're developing software from all these different countries in Asia. Where's your market? Oh, our market is all the major countries and everywhere in the world. So even the smallest startup companies, it seems, really are acting as, you know, global citizens and everywhere, um, you know, they go, they want to do things. So it's really an interesting aspect compared to the traditional life sciences companies that we've dealt with. Yeah, it almost, so to speak, evens the playing field, whereas in the traditional model, you have a very large company with very significant marketing capabilities. Now you can have both that or an equivalent information technology-based company that's a behemoth, as well as small to moderate-sized companies that are making products available through the web. So it's a, a very different dynamic in that respect. And I suppose as the subject matter of, of the partnership moves and progresses and develops, and we've kind of, suppose, touched on this, this earlier, the traditional ideas of, of the IP being licensed as part of the collaboration has changed ultimately because you are we've talked about patents and and trade secrets and know-how but we're moving much more into the 
unregistered kind of IP sector. Uh, I mean, perhaps Judith, you could you could let us, you know, give us some insight or secrets as to what you're seeing and, and how that's uh, what the tensions with the existing life sciences model, I suppose. Yes, as I said before, patents, trade secrets, know-how, trademarks, some regulatory exclusivity, those are traditional protections that still matter. What is different is how much the parties are going to be teaching each other about those technologies or enabling each other. So how broadly should the license operate? Traditionally, the parties were basically giving licenses under everything they control, everything they had a right to give that applied to the potential product. However, now companies that have more proprietary processes, uh, maybe an algorithm that is not protected by a patent and needs to be treated more as a trade secret, should that be licensed in the first place or should that just be practiced by the party that developed it? That's something we're seeing that's very different and we have to treat specially. The rights to practice basic R&D technology to prevent leakage of trade secrets has a heavier emphasis now than I've historically seen. And um, the essence of, you know, teaching each other, I think in the traditional life sciences uh, relationships, even if it's a license agreement and not a collaboration on license, still there was some, you know, level of teaching and tech transfer and collaboration in the tech healthcare tech relationships, if you will, since software and data is such an important part of the relationship in software for those you know, software geeks, there's that part of the software where it's, it's a source code where humans can read that code. And then there's that executable code. Um, once the, the software coder or the person who developed that code gives away that source code, you've just given away your entire asset. So the party that coded that source code should not be giving away that source code unless you've just, you know, it's a small minor software that you don't really care about. And that was the only product that you, you were developing for the other party. So initially, when biotech companies came into this world, they could not accept the fact that their tech partner was not releasing or transferring or teaching them how to develop these softwares, because in their traditional world, it was all about teaching each other. Also data, when uh, parties collected data, there was some you know, sense of sharing data or co-owning or the party who collected the data owning data and so on and so forth. But here, the tech companies need the data in order to train their AI and machine learning algorithms. So even if the original tech or software developer doesn't collect the data, um, they need the right or the ownership or license, it doesn't really matter to them, it seems, but they need these data that their uh, biotech licensees collect in order to train their uh, AI machine learning algorithms. So these are very heavily negotiated provisions, but the biotech licensees coming into these relationships are having um, a hard time, less so now, but originally they were having a hard time understanding where the tech companies were coming from uh, because the patent schemes uh, that they were used to were different from the software uh, schemes that the tech companies were more used to. I think historically, the larger companies feel that they pay for development of the technology and they should have all of the benefit of it, whereas the new schemes require people to understand, I'm going to be need to use my technology that may have been developed at the other party's expense to enhance my platform and enable me to do other deals. And that's a very different perspective that the parties often have challenges uh, bridging. And I suppose going slightly off script here, the conversation has been great and wide ranging is given the uh, you know understandable, I suppose, hesitancy or reticence by the, the software developer to just basically hand over the keys to the biotech company. Are we seeing any kind of conflict between the biotech company requiring some kind of hybrid or quasi exclusivity on the right to use the software on their data, not just on their data set, but just in a therapeutic area or with respect to a molecule, as that kind of exclusivity may have existed in a historical collaboration agreement? Yeah, I, 
I'm seeing the parties get stuck on that point very frequently. Uh, historically, you want to have exclusivity. So, you know, the partner's focused on your area that you're developing together. But in this new world of technology licensing in the life sciences sector, it almost can't work the same way. And figuring out the meets and bounds of where that exclusivity obligation uh, should exist is very difficult. And frankly, what we are structuring slightly differently in each deal. So it's evolving, is my sense. More often than not, the biotech licensee wants a very broad therapeutic, if not all field of use, worldwide exclusive rights to the software and its improvements from the technology licensor. And the software licensor would strongly resist granting such broad exclusive rights to a single biotech licensee. And a bit of crystal ball gazing, if I may. Do you think there'll ever be a scenario where where big pharma or biotech get comfortable that one of their key kind of data or AI or ML collaboration partners can happily collaborate with five or six of their main competitors because they're just a kind of software provider? Do you think we'll get there? I think we are there in part, and it's really technology dependent. If there's a way of good housekeeping, as I call it, if I promise not to do a particular activity, is there a way of monitoring whether or not I'm doing it and enforcing uh, the restrictions? Then there might be a way to craft uh, those types of restrictions. If there isn't, then you really do have a situation where leverage is going to dictate how broadly those those restrictions can exist. And we're seeing every deal vary significantly on that point. I think for having represented um, pharma, large pharma and large medical device clients working with um, AI, ML, technology companies, the question may come down also to, is the MI, AI ML company using my data in order to train that particular algorithm in order to enable my competitor? Um, and nowadays, it's not just any data, but it's also real world evidence or real world data. So companies are trying to get their hands on not just a snapshot of an individual or personal data, but also with consent, obviously, right, in compliance with pursuant to applicable law, long-term data so that they can understand, companies can understand how an individual or a group of individual progress over time. So if a company was able to access that data and in order to um, obtain use of a very well-trained AI ML algorithm, and then that algorithm turns around and enables a third-party competitor, that might be an absolute no. But otherwise, if it's lesser of an egregious situation, then, then I think with what Judith said, I absolutely agree. I think that might definitely be a possibility. So Judith and Jackie, I suppose on a, the last question I have for you is that given basically everything else has changed, be it the, the actual IP being licensed, the parties who are, who are participating in these licenses, what drives your regulatory approvals and the jurisdictions which you get into, I'm assuming that the economics of these transactions have also been altered from, from how you might expect them to exist. It depends. We still see traditional life sciences companies coming in and wanting to access machine learning or AI technologies, and they may expect their traditional, uh, more contingent, more back-end loaded uh, payments to be the way the compensation works. However, the technology companies have historically had a, a different way of pricing their products over a different time frame. So we are seeing a lot of very innovative economic structures that are essentially a hybrid. I'll let Jackie talk more about what the uh, AI digital health uh, scenarios are, but this is one area where the parties can really get stuck if they don't do their homework about what the other side's technology really is. And frankly, there's not 
the database out there of comparable transactions to look to. In a sense, the parties are really making it up as they go in part and uh, looking at things from different perspectives is what's required to get these deals across the finish line from my perspective. Making it up as they go right now seems to be how things are going. And um, I've seen anything and everything from a services relationship where um, if a customer, for example, pharma or medical device company used the AI ML platform, uh, then they would charge, or they as in the AI ML platform, a technology company would charge the customer on a fee-for-service basis or for, uh, you know, on a monthly or an annual basis. So it's really a customer vendor relationship. I've seen a partner relationship whereby if a product or a service was commercialized, uh, such product or a service would uh, entail certain royalties or milestones payable to the AI ML you know, company down the road, so contingent payments. I have seen um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis where case here is a human case. So for example, if it's a radiology AI ML reading software, on a per case basis, there would be a certain payment that would be cut to the AI ML platform. There are just so many, you know, payment structures that are just being floated around. And these are non-public data most of the times so that we just don't know what's what comparables are and what's market. It's just impossible to find out. Maybe we'll find out more down the road, but yeah, we don't know. That's what makes it a really interesting area to be involved in right now. Uh, you really have to pressure test all of your assumptions and you have to make the case for your perspective and yet be open to the other side's um, needs. Uh, they may be fundraising. They may need some different types of structures to meet specific situational needs. And that's what we as transactions attorneys need to be attuned to as we're navigating this new space. Absolutely. Judith and Jackie, thanks so much for your insights here. We're going to wrap things up, but this was a great discussion. And I really appreciate you taking the time to walk us through this complicated topic. It's clear that whilst these industries are converging, there's still a lot of convergence to be done. And companies that are looking to make this shift need to carefully consider as they move to join this rapidly growing segment of the industry. Thanks very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to this episode in our Connected with Latham podcast series. You can subscribe and listen to new and archived episodes of Latham's podcasts on LW.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. If you'd like more information about the topics in this podcast, please email us from links located in the show description. We hope you'll join us again next time. This podcast is provided as a service of Latham & Watkins LLP. Listening to this podcast does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and Latham and & Watkins LLP, and you should not send confidential information to Latham & Watkins LLP. While we make every effort to assure that the content of this podcast is accurate, comprehensive, and current, we do not warrant or guarantee any of those things. And you may not rely on this podcast as a substitute for legal research and or consulting a qualified attorney. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for engaging a lawyer to advise you on your individual needs. Should you require legal advice on the issues covered in this podcast, please consult a qualified attorney. Under New York's Code of Professional Responsibility, portions of this communication contain attorney advertising. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Results depend upon a variety of factors unique to each representation. Please direct all inquiries regarding the conduct of Latham & Watkins attorneys under the New York's disciplinary rules to Latham & Watkins LLP, 885 3rd Avenue, New York, New York, 10022-4834. Phone number 1212-906-1200.